Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this uh, BDBE webinar series. Uh, we have today the, the first webinar uh, of the year. And today we had the pleasure of having uh, three speakers who are going to present us uh, an overview of the work done uh, so far into, into projects. Uh, uh, the projects are insights and smooth, and uh, they, uh, they, they work, they work is in the scope of uh, data privacy, regulations, and tools. But before that, uh, allow me to say a few words about the, this uh, BDB webinar series. So this webinar is a part of a series where we are uh, inviting uh, speakers from different organizations, uh, innovation projects, etc., to talk about their experience working with uh, technologies related to big data and the artificial intelligence. Um, by the way, um, as usual, I take this opportunity to invite uh, any of you that have some co uh, some content that could be interesting for the community to contact me anytime, and uh, we can discuss about having a, a webinar related to your to your work. So, uh, as you can see on this slide, uh, the, the, the goal of these webinars is to show the value of big data, both from the technical and business perspectives, as well as touching different topics of, inter of interest for our community, such as lesson learning, best practices, innovation solutions, uh, societal debate, debates, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, at least we run one webinar per month, uh, typically on Tuesdays, not like this one that is on Friday, but normally it's in Tuesdays at, uh, at 12, like this one. Uh, so we stay tuned for, because the schedule depends on this one of the, uh, on the uh, context and the availability of the speakers. Uh, so if you are uh, interested in the, this series, uh, I, I, I would say that you could go the, to the uh, URL that is at the bottom of, the, of this page where you can find the previous webinars and uh, there will be more webinars coming in the coming in the coming months. So some housekeeping before jumping into the webinar. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, the question will be uh, taken at the end, but on the, in the meantime, you can write questions in the chat uh, through the tool. So the speakers will try to answer your questions at the end of the, of the, of the three presentations that we have. Um, sorry about that. Okay. so. Uh, I'm going to ask you a couple of, uh, of questions. So we are normally using uh, a, a, a poll to, to more or less check uh, the type of audience that we have and also to give some feedback to our, to our speakers. So let me send you a, a question you can answer through, through the tool. So I am launching it now. And this is about the, your interest. If, uh, if you are more tech, uh, interested in technical aspects related to big data, privacy, etc., or more in the business side of the application of big data and AI. So you can answer as, you, as I'm seeing that you are answering now. So I give you a few more seconds before uh, saying more or less the type of audience that we have today. So I give you a couple of more seconds. Okay. So I'm closing this one. And uh, it's around 60% of the people are more interested in technical aspects, while 40% are more in the business or sectorial application. And a second and last question, which is I'm launching as we speak. So it's more about the subject of this particular webinar. Uh, so if is your organization facing challenges uh, with the, the topic of the webinar, GDPR, data privacy, etc., and is it still an issue or, or if you are coping well, uh, or if you are uh, a technical provider of solutions for, for this type of, uh, of problems. So I see that you are replying. Okay, I give you also a few seconds to finalize. Okay, I'm waiting because uh, around 70% of the people voted. Okay, I'm closing now. So uh, the answers are around 40%. Uh, you are still having challenges uh, related to this. 20% are managing more or less well, and 40% are providing solutions. So I think that's uh, an interesting uh, information also for our speakers today, just to know the audience. The, the audience. So thank you very much for answering. And uh, now, without uh, any more uh, delay, I would like to 
uh, to present our speakers today. We have uh, the pleasure of having, as I, as I mentioned before, people from a couple of projects related to these topics. First of all, we have uh, Daniel uh, Bachelorner. I hope I said your your name well, uh, Daniel. He's from he's working on uh, on insights. He's from from Fraunhofer Austria, and uh, Daniel will be talking about uh, preserving technologies and, uh, and and reasons uh, why they are not more widely used uh, in practice. We have also Karen Clements from NESPA, and she's partner of, uh, of Smooth, and she will be talking about uh, more the relation to SMEs with this particular topic. And we have also Ros, uh, Rosa Araujo, who is from Eurecat, and uh, she's uh, the, the coordinator of the project Smooth, and uh, she will be talking more, uh, more about uh, the tools that uh, Smooth is providing. So without further delay, let me have the hand over to Daniel. Uh, so I give him the presenter rights uh, to you right now, Daniel, as we speak. So you should be able now to, to share the screen and, uh, and then the floor is yours. All right, I hope you can hear me and see my screen. Um, thanks a yes, lot for your introduction, to. Thomas. Um, so eSight is what I'm going to talk about today, just a, a short clarification. So the project ended in December, so it's over now. And for the project, um, I was working for Fraunhofer ISI, so one of the institutes in Germany. And I've already started last year to also work for Fraunhofer Austria. And since the beginning of this year, I'm, I'm fully working for Fraunhofer Austria. But we're dealing with similar topics. We're a bit more technical than the ISI in terms of our approach towards research and innovation but still dealing with similar questions so the idea today is to talk a bit about privacy preserving technologies um, that's what we did in eSites we looked um, at these technologies and aspects around them so how can they help addressing issues faced in the area of big data and ai and and what are the the issues and aspects around this application that have to be kept in mind and that have to be addressed when making progress in this field. So let's first have a quick look at um, what the objectives of eSites were and how we, um, how we proceeded in terms of methods, because this is quite important so that you know how we came up with these findings that I will also present today. So in terms of ob objectives, um, eSites tried to reach a common vision somehow of ethically sound or a common vision of an ethically sound approach to data use. And as a CSA, to achieve that, we have, of course, interacted a lot with different stakeholders. And the key thing um, eSites delivered um, towards the end of the project implementation period was coming up with a community position paper. And um, to get this done, it was really important for us not to write things down ourselves alone, but really integrate as many views as possible from from the community into this document and to really have a shared perspective. So this is what we wanted to do here. And it, generally the topic we are addressing is of course related to responsible research and innovation as we are trying to make or trying to help making a big data solutions more privacy friendly and to, to just help addressing all the issues around making that happen. And um, Below you see a dialogue between stakeholders. This is what we did. We tried, of course, also to involve somehow and to reach citizens directly. It wasn't really directly that we could do much, but indirectly we have certainly also had some impact on citizens, on, on the people, um, on the data subject, um, often affected by um, big data and artificial intelligence. So there is certainly something where more needs to be done. This is also one of the conclusions already of of what I can present today. And in terms of methods, um, we, um, we, sorry for that. So we um, investigated related projects, of course, as a CSA, we dealt with the other research and innovation actions focusing on privacy preserving uh, technologies, the innovation actions focusing on cross-sectorial um, data usage, data-driven innovation, the large scale pilots, and all the projects that, um, that were implemented in the last couple of years um by the european commission and we also try to go a bit beyond that but i will say a bit more about that in a second then um we tried not 
to only do research in this community of people implementing EU projects. We really wanted to go beyond that. So we also included um, external experts from industry, from research, from data protection authorities into our work and really also try to bring in their perspectives into our findings that we documented in our deliverables and white papers. And they were not only from Europe, of course, but also from the US and the Middle East. Um, then, of course, we also looked into the literature. We reviewed uh, a quite large number of articles, particularly with respect to understanding the current state of the art with respect to privacy preserving technologies. And one thing that I will present in a second is our map of privacy preserving technologies so that you have a better understanding of what we mean when we talk about that thing. And finally, um, interaction with a diverse set of stakeholders. We organized um, really many events and participated in many events during the implementation of eSites. Um, only in the last um, half of the project implementation, we attended the BDV PPP Summit in Riga, the BDVA Forum in Helsinki, European Technology Assessment Conference in Bratislava and many other events. So this is really something that was very important for us to get the views of a large number of people into our work and that's what we present. It's not, of course, one clear integrated opinion. It's trying to um, put things from a large uh, number of people together. Um, so it was a 36 month project, just to show you very quickly um, uh, what we did and how this is related to what I present today. So um, we started here in the middle with identifying ethical and societal issues in the context of big data and to some extent also um, artificial intelligence which became more popular during the, the project implementation. But of course, we, we try to pick up the ideas and make sure that our um, results are relevant for the data as the basis, base perspective and the algorithmic perspective from the world of AI. So trying to put that together. And another thing that I would like to mention now already is that we've all, always tried to have a positive stance towards the use of big data. We do not want to be the critical guys who always say, no, you can't do that, you shouldn't do that, you should be careful. We really want to uh, use the potential in data and in algorithms that is definitely there, but not at any cost. And to see what can we do to make sure that ethical societal issues around that are also taken into account. Okay, then let's go through them a bit quick, uh, quick here. We have um, identified privacy preserving technologies. We have assessed them, we conducted a gap analysis, so we wanted to see to what extent are these technologies able to deal with these issues that we identified. We then came up with design requirements, so how should big data solutions be designed in order to really meet somehow um, requirements of being um, privacy friendly. We looked into existing solutions, assessed them somehow in different fields such as healthcare, transportation and um, web surfing and advertising in this e-commerce context and wanted to find out what, why are they doing what in terms of uh, measures to be privacy preserving. We identified implementation barriers and ways to overcome them. This was very much connected to this community position paper that I already mentioned. And finally, we tried to distill um, sets of recommendations from the work that we did um, over these 36 months. And the the bubbles that I've highlighted now are the ones that um, will play a particular role in this presentation. I will present these privacy preserving technologies, our understanding of them, and then um, um, give you an understanding of our view on um, um, on why they are implemented and why they are not implemented um, probably to to a sufficient extent. All right, so let's um, look into the, the map of technologies that we have put together. So there are a couple of icons that you can see and um, uh, names of different classes of technologies that we have looked into and that we have come across in our work. And um, I would like to say a few words only about them because there are quite many and also, um, already start to, to group them somehow to, so, to show you that there is some kind of structure in them as we presented them. So um, I highlight the first set, and these are all related to the data itself and, um, and how it's 
how um, how it's um, changed or modified in order to to address certain concerns by certain technologies. So we have anonymization, which um, removes personally identifiable information, of course. We have sanitization, which somehow includes anonymization, but goes beyond that because other critical information, which is not related directly to personally identifiable things, is, is also removed or changed by sanitizing data sets. We have certainly encryption. Don't not have to say much about um, what's behind that, of course. But there are also some very interesting developments that can really impact the field a lot in, in the near future, such as homomorphic encryption, which really gives a lot of new opportunities on how data can be used without revealing actually the, the contents of the data. We have multi-party computation, which is also very promising and where several projects have already focused on. And um, it's also something which will um, for the mature and increasing relevance in in uh, in our opinion and finally deletion uh, which means that data is permanently deleted so these are all related to um changing the data somehow to improve the situation then we have another set which is related to the the actual handling of data and controlling this handling of data policy enforcement um, of course that i have technological ways to enforce certain rules on the use and handling of data and um, access control is a certain group of policies that I can enforce on my infrastructure to make sure that um, access is restricted to, um, to those who are authorized to access it. And accountability is also, of course, related to these other two um, uh, technology classes because um, it's related to evaluating the compliance with policies and the provision of evidence that I have been compliant over a certain period of time. So these are related to the handling of data. And finally, we have um, a couple of classes of technologies which are related to empowering the user, making the user able to, to actually deal with the data, to, to, to use it, to understand what's happening, um, and this is, of course, true for, for the data perspective and the algorithmic perspective that um, um, aspects such as transparency are, of course, highly important. Um, data provenance. So um, it should be clear what happened to data, how it uh, emerged and how it was manipulated over its existence. Um, we have transparency, as I already said, making explicit what and how information is collected, how it's processed, how it's used. Um, we have access and portability, so um, users can have through these technologies access to their data, see what's stored about them in databases, and they also have the chance to move their data from one place to another, um, which is related to portability. And finally, we have um, uh, user control, which is also a very important field, of course, um, which gives the end user control over the data. This is, of course, very much appreciated at first sight, but as you will see in a second, it's not that easy because um, people on the one hand do not really want to care that much about their data and make every setting individually. There are some, of course, that do that, but there are many that do, just do not want to do that. They want to, to, to be active in a safe environment already, and they do, do not want this 100% extent of user control but we will come back to that in a second so let me go through a couple of results of the assessment of the existing privacy preserving technologies that we did and afterwards we will look uh, a bit more specifically into aspects related to the um, integration of these technologies into solutions so let's go through that quickly to not use too much time so the set of technology classes that we have, um, the feedback that we got from, from the community as well, it's, it's quite comprehensive. It's certainly not perfect. It doesn't include everything, but it gives us a reasonably good understanding of the landscape of technologies that we have to have on the radar when we want to analyze them. Then the, there is not one single best technology that you have to implement. It's always about combinations of those to set up a, a privacy friendly or a, a system, a, a solution that um, addresses ethical and societal issues. 
Um, the technologies, of course, as we have already seen, pursue different aims. So one example here could be that while some aim at overcoming the need for trust in other parties, such as multi-party commutation or homomorphic encryption, others um, really focus more on increasing trust, such as policy enforcement, accountability, transparency. Um, Multidimensional measure is required. It's not just um, the degree of protection that certain technologies deliver, but also the cost at what this comes that has to be taken into account. And there are, of course, many tensions between the objectives of the, the field, um, data analytics, and the, the technologies on the other hand, of course, because on the one hand, you want to protect data. On the other hand, you want to, to use it. And this is not always uh, straightforward to find the right trade-off, the, the way in the middle that allows you really to take most of the potential of the data without going too far. And then let's look on the right side quickly. Um, we have here perceptions and, uh, and information about the use of the data, and we have a limited integration. Um, you do not find many big data solutions with uh, a significant share of these technologies being implemented. There is of course, the first reason for that is that's the second bullet point here on the right side. There is a rather low demand, which also has to be understood in order to understand why we do not have this, um, this um, more comprehensive integration. We have considerable regional, regional differences in terms of application and usage, but also in terms of perception. We always need to combine technical measures with non-technical things, with processes, with people, educated people, and things like that. So it's not a technology alone solution that will um, solve all our issues. And it's not yet fully clear who really has to take responsibility for that. There are, let me say, different opinions on, on who should be responsible. So I highlight the two points that we will pay more attention to in the next couple of minutes. It's the limited integration and, of course, closely related to that, the low demand. Um, so we approached this limited integration from two different perspectives. On the one hand, from the societal and economic perspective, and on the other hand, from a legal and ethical perspective. Fraunhofer in the project focused on the societal and economic aspects, so I will focus on them today. And there is also not enough time to go through the legal and ethical aspects as well. But um, as you might have seen in, in gray, you see on the slides um, references to resources, and there you find all the information um, on our website um, in the deliverables and also in more compact and focused white papers that we have created for many of the key results of the project. All right, so let's quickly go through these aspects that um, I have identified here. We have costs and benefits that play a role. So um, privacy preserving solutions, making them privacy preserving, this leads to additional costs that have to be taken into account. Um, and um, the costs are not just monetary, there are also costs such as user inconvenience. And there is no evidence currently that um, privacy preserving solutions really lead to increased sales or justify higher prices. This is also related to the point economic value that we have. Um, on the left side. And it has to be clear that in the end, if you're not forced to meet certain privacy preservation criteria, it has to make economic sense. Then with respect to business models, we also see a couple of conflicts, particularly when we look at aspects such as purpose limitation and data minimization, which is not 100% in line, of course, with what some people might want to do. Um, profits uh, made are not really shared among those providing data's, uh, data and those integrating and analyzing them. This could be an, an issue that has to be taken into account here. There is always a trade-off between privacy protection and the utility of data. And uh, in certain fields, there is also a fear that privacy preservation could lead to limitations regarding flexibility and um, the ability to innovate. For instance, the smart city context was um, often cited here. Public attention, I only want to emphasize one point here. This is what's also referred to as um, privacy as a strategy, which increases um, um, awareness, which, which gets more and more important. So actors um, see privacy preservation as something that can lead to competitive differentiation. Apple is one example which really 
um, try to position itself as a company that takes privacy seriously for certain reasons, of course, but um, this is something we can't go very much into detail now. Economic value, that's also quite an interesting topic because there has been lots of research um, on um, economic aspects. So aspects like the willingness um, to accept giving away data and the willingness to pay to protect privacy. Concerns and expectations differ a lot between people. Only minor changes really lead to completely different um, results. What's very interesting is that um, research has revealed that if there is a price difference, in most cases, the privacy-unfriendly company that is a little cheaper attains the, great, um, attains the greater market share. And um, the value that is attached to privacy is also dependent on social class. Now the last two, very quickly, before we come to a conclusion, um, is that cultural fit. There is a broad range of, of different views that big data and um, artificial intelligence might lead to de-individualization or to personalization and everything that lies between uh, uh, in terms of shades of gray somehow. Um, this third bullet here refers to the, the aspect that I mentioned before related to this too much of user empowerment, less involvement is preferred sometimes. And um, we have also clear indications that how people feel, what concerns are raised by unauthorized secondary use or by errors in databases, this is also very much culturally dependent. Finally, skill level is also critical with respect to limited integration. Um, we need a, a good understanding to integrate and use privacy preserving technologies. So this is really the experts view that need the right skills, but also in more general, um, valuing privacy, taking a lot of advantage of data, this needs to, uh, this needs somehow a change in mindset. And often even critical people do not really know what questions to ask. And last two slides to conclude somehow, just showing in which, doc we, uh, which documents we, explain a bit in what direction um, solutions can go or what what major groups of solutions we we could identify in our work um, we have the need to really embed things um, it has to be by default um, I'm waiting for people to activate features which are not tightly integrated and pre-configured there is there is only a little chance that this will be successful then it's absolutely important to take preventive me measures for several reasons um, and technologies are a good way to be proactive in terms of avoiding data breaches um, apart from technology people and processes are at least as important and um, um, apart from compliance with laws also compliance with corporate policies and making uh, particularly ethical policies is really critical. So we've gone through those. And last slide from my side, um, we have come up in the final deliverable, which we have only recently uploaded to our website with um, rather general recommendations for different groups of actors. We have recommendations for developers and operators of data-driven solutions, um, of the developers of privacy preserving technologies, policy makers, um, and um, civil society organizations mainly, which somehow, of course, um, represent the individuals that are affected by what we see here. So that's it for the moment from my side, and I'm happy to take questions at the end of the webinar. Thanks a lot for listening. Thank you, Daniel. Can you hand it over to yeah, Karen? I just did that. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, Karen, you should unmute yourself. Sorry, <laughs> I started without unmuting. Hello, thank you, um, Daniel. Thank you, Thomas. My name is Karen Clements, and um, today I'm speaking on behalf of the European Small Business Alliance. Um, which is the, uh, an independent voice for European entrepreneurs, representing about uh, a million micro and small companies across Europe. And I'm going to talk today about the compliance issues that SMEs have uh, in relation to the GDPR 
and um, and and why therefore um, projects like Smooth are so vital. Um, and I'm going to. Um, I would just like to say that uh, in general, um, our members support the overriding objective of GDPR. Um, they want their own data protected, and they understand that it's good business to do the same for their clients and their stakeholders. Um, some of them even um, are beginning to understand that, that data is only valuable with consent attached to it. Um, that said, as we know, the legislation was conceived largely to tackle bad practices of mainly big players, and the fines issued so far um, have been mainly to large companies, not exclusively, but mainly, um, which is ironic because uh, the, the regulation affects um, micros and SMEs disproportionately. Um, that's the, the, the constant uh, issue for SMEs is that they may represent the majority of firms, but they have the least capacity to conform to new, um, new regulations. Um, there, to date, there hasn't been a widespread independent evaluation of compliance of SMEs to GDPR, but there is significant anecdotal evidence from um, uh, our own organisation, other business organisations such as uh, Business Europe and Eurosham and SME United, um, who all represent um, SMEs one way or another, uh, and they say the same. They say that SMEs are eager to complain. They literally can't, uh, whether it's for good business uh, reasons, whether it's because they believe that, that, that data should have consent attached to it or, or, or whether it's because they can't risk a fine. Um, they have spent significant resource on uh, consultants, legal consultants and on IT and, and often, and this is, this is uh, quite sad, um, the advice that they've been given has been misleading. Um, not least around the, the need for systematic consent. Um, but I would say that the, the, the bottom line is that they are utterly confused by the complexity of the regulation, and particularly those whose core business is not data processing. And uh, they're not able across the board to test compliance, um, even if they understand what it is that they need to do. Uh, there's a, 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 an interesting survey carried out by GDPR.eu, which is a Horizon 2020 project, and showed um, that uh, two thirds of um, individuals who'd been uh, surveyed claimed that their organisation did, in fact, use an end to end encrypted email. But then when they were asked to specify which provider, only about 9% uh, named a service with, with, with that kind of encryption built in, and, and some even uh, referred to um, irrelevant companies and technologies like Dropbox or MailChimp. Um, and, and more worryingly, almost 50% of respondents said they didn't always determine a lawful basis for processing their, their user data before uh, doing so. Um, in terms of ESBA members, they tell us that the main difficulties with the regulation are assessing whether one is a data controller or a data processor. Um, they uh, have difficulty working out what processing at large scale means because there's no definition in the regulation. Um, understanding whether they need to keep records for processing activities because there's no minimum threshold for when to include a processing activity in the records or indeed um, understanding if they need to appoint a data protection officer. And finally, um, for defining the principle of accountability. Um, and in reality, uh, there are few uh, exceptions for SMEs, and those exceptions that there are, are, are chimeric, I suppose, is the, the best way of describing them. So, Despite significant efforts by the European Data Protection Board, by the European Commission and some data protection authorities, the quality of guidance and support for SMEs to comply with GDPR varies dramatically from one member state to another. Um, not only that, um, there are different interpretations of the rules from one DPA to another. So recently, um, for example, the Dutch DPA 
has ruled out um, commercial interests and profit maximisation as legitimate, uh, which goes against the text of the GDPR and its recitals. And Germany has introduced more stringent requirements on the appointment of data, of data protection officers for, for, for very small companies. So what are the solutions? Well, we could review uh, the legislation, um, insert some definitions, some thresholds, but it's only two years old and there is a certain um, feeling that it's premature uh, to uh, revise it now as its impact is still being understood. What we certainly need is a single set of European data protection rules that are uniformly enforced and um, member states must eliminate the divergences that they are introducing. Sorry, but I, I think Probably the, the most important thing is that SMEs have consistent communication and tailored information. Um, and so the focus has to be on providing better self-assessment tools, um, tools to assess, plan and check their compliance. Now, there are some tools in the regulation, standard contractual clauses, codes of conduct, certification, etc. Um, but these are almost uh, a luxury um, and uh, can be applied once uh, uh, an SME understands what their, their compliance requirement requirements are. There are some very, uh, there is some best practice um, in terms of self-evaluation tool toolkits that have been issued by the data protection authorities. So, for example, the um, CINI, the French data protection officers, uh, um, has authority has teamed up with BIPI France, and they've provided some tailored guidelines which um, allow um, SMEs to uh, double-check compliance. And um, the uh, UK data protection authority, the ICO, has also um, provided some very, some excellent information and quality um, toolkits. And, and the Hungarians, for example, have introduced a, a hotline for SMEs to call in to be able to answer um, their, their, every question and any question that they may that they may have. Um, the Commission's given the DPAs quite a bit of money since May uh, 2008 to help them reach out. Um, about 3 million euros. Uh, this could be stepped up, but also uh, there needs to be um, more support given to EU funded projects uh, which aim to support online tools and internal training um, such as Smooth. Um, Rosa, who's coming after me, will tell you about the project um, and give you an up-to-date account of where we're at with it. Um, it is uh, potentially a, an extremely useful tool for um, SMEs and w could revolutionise their, their understanding and their ability to comply with GDPR. Thank you very much. Hello, thank you Karen and thank you Thomas for the entrance, for the presentation. My name is Rosa Araujo and I'm the project manager um, in, in Euricat and also the smooth coordinator. As previously uh, explained my colleague Karen, complying with GDPR is a challenge for SMEs because apart from the lack of awareness, they can rarely afford professional legal advice due to their lack of data protection expertise and limited resources. Micro enterprises are particularly vulnerable in the implementation of the GDPR. And on the other hand, SMEs are the backbone of the European economy because they employ two out of three employees and represent the 99.8% of the EU non-financial sector. In order to help SMEs 
SMOOTH project aims to assist organizations to comply with key requirements of the GDPR by designing and implementing an easy-to-use and affordable cloud-based platform service. SMOOTH platform is a cloud-based tool to become the reference solution in Europe for GDPR compliance validation for micro-enterprises and it will be launched in English, Spanish, Latvian and Italian and will be also in the future extensible to other languages. As a basic requirement, Smooth Platform has to be simple and easy to use by users with limited or no knowledge at all of data protection legislation. It has to be inexpensive so that any micro enterprise can afford it. It has to assess compliance against key aspects of the GDPR providing guidance and recommendations to any sector of activity. In order to achieve the objectives, SMOOTH is developing advanced technology for automatically assess compliance with key elements of the GDPR. As they are, for example, the SMOOTH-X that is for the automated analysis of the key text documents related to the protection of personal data, data as they are the privacy policy, cookie notice, the inform of consent forms. Then we have also the smooth data that is for the automated analysis of the databases to identify the presence of personal data um, and also for uh, detecting the compliance with the data minimization principle. Then we have also the smooth lime module that is for the automated analysis of personal data collection and exploitation from websites and mobile apps. Then the combination of all these automated uh, tests that these technologies will develop will be supplemented with context information of the main microenterprises under analysis. Then during the registration process in the SMOOTH platform, the microenterprise is asked to fill in a questionnaire with contextual information on its processing activities. This information is to be used together with the automated test results to generate a compliance report, providing feedback on aspects of compliance and in case of not compliance, guidance and recommendations on how to remedy the identified problems. We have uh, just conducted a first pilot and to cover the company's diversity and to assess the potential of the platform, the consortium has focused on three verticals, traditional companies, digital, and also uh, companies ma managing sensitive personal data. For the first pilot, we have recruited 100 microenterprises. 31% were traditional, 58% were digital, and 11% were dealing with special categories of data. We understand for traditional companies, the ones that are used by every day by millions of European citizens. Examples of uh, these companies are retail shops, real estate agencies, repair shops, restaurants, family business. For digital men, we have mainly small technological startups that offer online services or interact with their customers using websites uh, or mobile apps. And then uh, the ones that are dealing with special categories of data or sensitive personal data, that the most typical examples are to be found in the health sectors, such as doctors, psychologists, physiotherapists, or pharmacies. After finishing the first pilot of the system, from the feedback received, what we have found 
is that a large number of micro companies are self-employed, such as the hairdresser on the corner or the local florist, the mechanic, uh, when they are asked if they have a consent form to keep their clients' contact details, like name, address, telephone, they don't really know what a, a consent form is. Many of them have no digital background or legal knowledge. There is a great lack of previous education in the GDPR. When we ask for legal basis, only 12% does never rely on consent for processing and storing personal data. Only 18% makes use of informal consent forms. When talking about processing of sensitive data, notably the 76% of the microenterprises have indicated that they do not know whether or not they are processing special categories of data. A rather alarming result is that only 35 answer positively to the question whether they apply some basic security measures. The 88% of the companies that took part in the questionnaire owns a website, whereas 53% has a mobile app. The results of the first pilot show that the, fa the fact that uh, still not all the companies have all the necessary informative documents in their websites. For example, terms of use are used by the 74% of the respondents privacy policies only by 65 and cookie policies only by 53%. In view of this, the Smooth project has first identified those needs of uh, companies and is trying to help them to move to actual compliance with the GDPR and creating awareness. In July, we will start the second pilot with 60 companies to validate the complete system including the compliance report. And the last three months of the project, that is to be from September to October, we will intend to move to involve 500 companies for the market validation. Uh, I take the, this opportunity to say that if among the audience there are SMEs uh, that want to be part of the pilot, I leave you here the link for contacting us. Apart from the Smooth platform, we will also be launching uh, this Smooth handbook for helping to fill this gap of education and awareness. Uh, this will be an online interactive handbook to provide guidance, examples, videos and links to external resources. It will explain how GDPR affects companies and the procedures to follow in order to be GDPR compliant. It will be launched in two versions, website and mobile app. And finally, who is behind Smooth? Uh, as legal partners, we have Q11, the university, and two DPAs, the Spanish and the Latvian. We have also the Italian DPA forming part of the Smooth Advisory Board. As SME representative for taking their requirements, we count with Funding Box and also ESBA. For technical partners, we have UC3M, India, and Listec for the website and mobile module. Naver and Eurecat is uh, dealing with the legal documents analysis and NEC and Eurecat also for the data basis analysis. And we count also with UNE that is a standardization body. And that's all from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. And here am I, uh, I am for any question or comment. Thank you very much, Rosa. Thank you to all the presenters, I think that would be there's there's has been very interesting facts in your three presentation i'm especially let's say worried about the the figures and the numbers that you you mentioned for 
uh, for the, the SMEs, especially the, the family-run businesses, which uh, I think the awareness is not uh, really high. To, it, it is expected, but uh, at least it, it's somehow shocking to see this high number with high figures. So at least from my side. So we now open the, um, the floor for, for questions. Let me show just my screen to just to, to see again the, the website where we will be um, uploading the, the slides and also the recording of this webinar. So you will we will have this uh, in our website uh, probably by tomorrow the day or, or by Monday. And uh, yeah, the, the floor is open. I have uh, already a couple of questions uh, from the audience that I, I got. So one is, uh, is from uh, all panelists, I would say. So this uh, the question is, uh, do panelists expect a, a higher demand of uh, privacy preserving technologies as the GDPR slowly is kicking in? So this is a question that uh, is you can, all of any of you can, can answer. All right, I can briefly comment on that. Um, I think that things will change and um, that they, they have already changed through a legislation such as the GDPR. Um, so when we look at these um, aspects from the social and economic perspective that I've listed, you see that there are still things that have to change in terms of uh, public attention, mindset, culture and, and education also. Um, and also the, the, the economic perspective is also very important in this regard because that's what drives companies to, to a significant extent. And therefore, I would say that legislation is really something that can lead to action in that regard and that makes changes most likely currently. Okay, and related to that is, uh, do you think that, uh, because uh, as you know, many, especially researchers, think that um, GDPR uh, put some heavily uh, or some constraints to, to research in general, especially uh, with uh, access to data. So do you think that this is uh, somehow a problem for Europe or an opportunity for Europe? Um, I think that it's, um, it's both. Of, um, that's that's probably the easiest answer here. I think it's it might be challenging um, in some respects um, in the short term, particularly because um, organizations have to um, to to find a way to arrange somehow and to deal with these um, regulations that are around them, um, which which definitely might be um, somewhat challenging. But I think in the longer run, it's really critical that the data economy and whatever happens on the basis of data, including AI, of course, which, which plays a key role in analyzing and, and making value out of data, um, then there is trust, very important. Otherwise, you, you won't get uh, the data and you won't have a reasonable basis for, for your analysis. And to achieve that, um, it can really be a strength and something that really enables um, um, a lot of things. This is the general perspective and also it enables um, a business potential in terms of um, organizations really trying to find ways to, to deal with these regulations, to implement them smoothly into day-to-day -day processes. So that's it not something artificial that somehow um, affects a, a company negatively, but some, something that's really deeply integrated into the way how um, businesses work in a more and more data-driven world. Um, yes, can I can I agree with that? I think that in the longer term, that 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 is a correct assessment that um, it, it will change uh, behaviour um, and it will become for for businesses a uh, second nature. Um, but in the meantime, uh, reg legislation has to be well drafted. It has to take into account the peculiarities of, of, of smaller businesses, and there have to be uh, there have to be tools provided for all businesses, not just from one member state to another that's that's you know um, got its act together, um, so that they can comply, and so it becomes easy for them to do it. And Maya Jam also here, I think these constraints that GDPR is imposing, um, the fear that 
companies are having for interchanging their data uh, will lead to the creation of data markets where affiliated members uh, will trust between them and will establish the rules for inter interchanging their, their data in a secure uh, manner, in a secure environment. Okay, th thank you very much. Uh, another question is that is more related to to the awareness of the SMEs of, uh, of the GDPR issues. So, do you have any suggestion in general on how to reach uh, this, uh, especially these micro companies that we were mentioning at the beginning? At the beginning, so is is there any strategy from the EC or some suggestions that you can make from the, at least from the smooth project in in order to reach out to these uh, to these small companies that uh, sometimes are really far far away from these discussions that we we have, uh, let's say, for bigger companies or even at, uh, at a regulatory level for the from the EU? Well, I think the EC is implementing uh, uh, solutions with other projects on top of Smooth also for helping them. Also, the DPAs that, that we know that we are in touch are also putting um, ways to communicate with them, with hotlines, for helping them for being compliant. And we hope smooth tools will help, help them, will be re very relevant. We are organizing webinars, we will be very active in dissemination activities until the end of the project. And the, the DPAs that are involved are also uh, hoping that smooth will help micro enterprises yeah and there's another question precisely related to to this uh, and the and the, the role of the dpas because uh, the, the question is uh regarding dpa uh, self-assessment tools how do you guarantee the validity of such a tools or should they go only via the dpas uh, so that the, these are the questions Um, well, I, I think that they can, yes, I, I think the validity of, DP, of what DPA provides is, um, so, it, it, so the, the, it is, an, you know, the national authority and it is trusted. What's, what's not clear is whether the quality is as good as those tools that are provided by other DPA. So it's really important that they all um, provide best practice. Um, self-assessment and um uh, and support um when it comes to the projects uh, it's you know the fact that they are ec funded means that they have a, a validity and they are safe to use i mean th those you know these are brands that businesses understand um and that they uh, uh, that they will trust uh, to use i would certainly say to any of our members don't you know, when you click on GDPR, when you Google GDPR, um, the first thing that comes up are various businesses trying to get money out of you to explain what GDPR, you know, uh, means for your business. And chances are they won't give you the right information. So our advice is go to the DPAs and 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 look for e EC funded tools. Okay, so thank thank you very much. I think well, we have one more question, but I think it's uh, it's one o'clock already, and we should finish the the the, um, the webinar. So I I think that that has been a very interesting uh, uh, set of presentations and and questions and answers. So I thank you very much that the the, the three presenters for uh, for their their contributions and also the to the audience for for being here at, until the very end. And uh, as you can see, uh, and as, as I said before, there is uh, this uh, this three presentation plus the recording will be uh, will be uh, shared uh, with uh, in this URL that you have at the bottom of the page here, and you will receive tomorrow uh, uh, an email with uh, with these details. So don't worry if you don't have the time to to write it down. And and just uh, thank you very much uh, again to everybody for attending. 
and we will have more webinars coming in the next month so if you are uh, interested in this series uh, just go regularly to this web page we also issue some uh, emails to interested people uh, especially in the scope of the bdba projects and also the the different organizations so just stay tuned and uh, yeah thank you to everybody and thank you especially again to the to the three presenters thank you thank very you. much thomas thank you bye bye Goodbye. Bye. Bye. -bye.